is on choosing, choosing Optics by Chris Heisinger, um, the owner of Land, Sea, and Sky. And I'm going to stop sharing, and he's going to start sharing this. All right. I was talking about binoculars or something. All right. Are we ready? We are ready. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. I do have a few slides, which I'll share here in a minute, but I want to just get started by introducing myself. Um, I, my name is Chris Heisinger. I am the owner of Land, Sea, and Sky. Uh, Land, Sea, and Sky is a business located in Houston, Texas, and we specialize in optics, for lack of a better term. Um, we, of course, sell burning binoculars. We sell spotting scopes. Uh, we also sell astronomical telescopes, and we sell microscopes. So we cater to anybody who is looking to see something that's either really far away or really small, um, bigger. And uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We also repair um, most of the things we sell. So if you've ever had an old pair of binoculars that you've sent in to repair, you've probably come across our name because we're one of the few companies in the United States that still does that kind of work. Um, the company is quite old. We've been around since 1940. We started out repairing ship's compasses, had nothing to do with optics. But of course, most of you probably know that binoculars are a very important part of what is on the bridge of a ship. So um, as the original founder of the company um, saw opportunities in the nautical market, he started selling and repairing binoculars for the ship's captains that were bringing the compasses in. Um, interestingly enough, we still repair ship's compasses, um, calling all along the Gulf Coast, or ships calling all along the Gulf Coast. That's not a huge business. But it's, again, one of the niches where we operate, and it's kind of an exciting place to be. So tonight, I want to talk a little bit about um, binoculars for birding. Uh, I am not an expert birder. I've been doing it for about six years. I actually got into this business because of an interest in astronomy, but quickly learned that birding suited my lifestyle a lot better. Namely, I don't like to stay up super late. So unless I'm out looking for owls, um, I'm usually in by dark. But... Um, but it's uh, you know it's it's been a it's been a great hobby for me. Um, it's been a great business for me um, since I took over the business. Um, we as a company have started attending every major bird festival in the state of Texas. We go to San Diego annually to sell optics. Uh, we go to the biggest week in American birding. We do a festival in Maine, and for the first time, we're doing a festival in Florida, um, the Florida Birding and Nature Festival, in a couple of weeks down in I think Tampa. Um, so um, if you are down at that festival, you should stop by our table and you'll be able to try out um, a lot of the optics that I'll be talking about tonight. So binoculars, I'm sure everyone on this call owns or has access to a pair of binoculars. You're kind of an essential part of birding. Um, you, of course, can watch birds without them, but it's always easier to identify uh, the birds you're looking at when you can get a closer view. And the whole idea of binoculars is to make the image that is in front of you appear bigger. And they do that through a series of lenses um, that you know, take the light and focus it on a point, um, preferably at your eye, and uh, allow you to um, resolve detail that you wouldn't normally be able to resolve. And with that, I'll start sharing my screen. And if you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I can either answer them at the end or um, as I go. So first I wanna talk about the two kind of types of binoculars and you've probably all seen um, you know, binoculars that look like one of these two pair pictured on this, um, on this screen. Um, the ones on the left are um, roof prism binoculars and the ones on the right are called poro prism binoculars. And they operate identically. There's really no difference in how they're used. Um, they both take light at the big end. That's called the objective end. Um, they pass it through a series of prisms where the light then comes out the smaller end, which is where the eyepiece is, and that's what creates the magnification. And um, I'll show a graphic that shows kind of what the light does inside each of these binoculars. Um, you can see the one on the left is the roof prism and the one on the right is the poro prism. Both contain two sets of prisms, both contain the objective lenses and the eyepiece lenses. So really the only difference is the layout of those prisms. And the 
Poro Prism Design is really the older style. So if you've got an old pair of binoculars, perhaps from a relative, um, from you know World War II era or from the 60s or 70s or even 80s, they probably look like Poro Prism binoculars. Most modern binoculars today are designed like the roof prism. And I think part of the reason, I'm not 100% sure why that change was made. I think that technology advances allowed them to make roof prism binoculars more cost-effective and they're generally a bit more ergonomic. They're not quite as big. Um, they can make them more compact. Um, I think there's some other advantages with regard to the size of the barrel and how wide the field of view can be. But essentially, most binoculars today are probably going to be roof prism, though you will still see poor prism binoculars out there, particularly if you look at the bigger marine binoculars. A lot of them are poor prism binoculars. Now, I'm sure if you've been around binoculars at all, you have heard the terms 8x42 or 10x50 or 8.5x44 or 10x32 or 7x25. Um, those are numbers that specify the magnification and the objective diameter. And um, so the first number, almost always, is the magnification. So in an 8x42 millimeter binocular, the 8 refers to the magnification. And what that means is objects looking through the binocular will appear to be eight times bigger than they do with your naked eye. Whether or not that's actually true is probably a matter of debate, but the bottom line is objects will appear closer when you use binoculars. Similarly, a 10 is going to be closer than an eight. So if you use a 10 by 42 versus an eight by 42, the image should look slightly larger in a 10 power than an eight power. The second number refers to the objective diameter. And the objective diameter is, if we go back to this graph, the diameter of this objective lens down at the bottom. And what that determines is the amount of light that gets through the binocular and is available for your eye. So the bigger that number, the more light is going to go through the binocular. And that causes, that, that affects a number of attributes of the binocular. And I'll just kind of go over um, some of those attributes. So as magnification increases, objects obviously appear closer. The field of view almost always gets smaller. And so field of view is the amount of the scene that you can see. And when you're using a higher power magnification, you're always seeing a narrower field of view. What some people don't realize is that higher magnification also means that less lights gets to your eye. So an image is gonna appear dimmer to your eye when you go up in magnification. And it may not be a huge difference when you go from an eight to a 10, but if you go from an eight to a 12 or an eight to a 15, you can see a noticeable decrease in the brightness of the image. And that can make the resolution, you know, the image doesn't have as much contrast. So you see less detail. As the image gets dimmer, you tend to see less detail. So if you're really trying to pick out fine detail on a bird or other animal, um, a lot of times a lower magnification will help you because you're going to see, um, you're going to have um, better resolution and better brightness with which to, to see those subtle changes in color. Um, also, as magnification goes up, shape may be worse. This may be a problem for some people, particularly if you have problems holding binoculars steady. But a lot of times, if you find that you can't get a nice steady image at a particular power, you might want to try going down to magnification to help with any, you know, handshake that is present um, either from your hands or on the platform you're on um, while you're using the binoculars. Now, as objective diameter is increased, more light is captured. The bigger that lens, the more light gets into your eye. The resolution increases. That kind of goes along with the brightness. As you let in more light, you can see more detail even without increasing the magnification. So you always want as much light as you can get. Um, the trade-off though is that the binocular size and weight also increase. So um, a lot of people think that they want a 50 millimeter binocular, but once you've been carrying it around for a couple hours in the field, you realize that it is quite a bit heavier than a 32 or a 42 millimeter. And you know that may um, temper your enthusiasm for the increased light. So let me just stop sharing for a minute. And I've got some binoculars here that I just want to walk through the various parts of a binocular. And I'm just going to hold on just a second. I'm going to make my screen a little bigger so that I can, um, let's see here, get a better view of what I'm doing. So in any event, um, I've got some binoculars here and I just want to walk through um, the various 
parts of the binocular. So this is similar to the image I was showing. The large end here is the objective end. So this is the primary gatherer of light. And this is, in this particular case, is a 42 millimeter binocular. Um, the other end where you put the eyes are the eyepiece end. Um, this is what determines the magnification, actually. The lens right here is the only thing that changes when you go from an eight power to a 10 power or a 10 power to a 12 power. They change this lens in the back of the binocular. That is the only difference. Um, most modern binoculars have retractable eye cups, which come in and out. Um, generally speaking, if you do not use glasses, um, you would want these eye cups um, extended. And what these do is they help provide the necessary offset from your eye to the field lens so that um, you get a nice clean view of the image. Um, you can use the binoculars without them, but the eye cups just kind of help you find that sweet spot every time. And there's usually some stops along the way. So you can find the sweet spot that is suitable for you, your eyes. Now, if you're using glasses, when you use your binoculars, you almost always want to screw all the, those all the way in because your glasses actually provide the standoff you need um, when you're using a pair of binoculars. I personally don't wear glasses when um, I'm birding. I, these glasses I have on are for reading um, and I wear contacts, generally speaking. So I almost always have the eye cups fully extended. Um, binoculars also usually have something called a diopter adjustment. Um, and that allows you to adjust the relative focus between the left and the right eye cup. And going back to the glasses example, if you have glass, if you wear glasses, um, but you don't want to wear them while birding, but your eyes are two different prescriptions, this adjustment would allow you to account for the fact that one eye has a different focus than the other eye. So um, in my case, my eyes are a little bit different, so I would adjust the diopter a little bit if I was wearing them without my contacts. And that sometimes, most people, I shouldn't say most, but some people like to use the binoculars without their glasses, it's more comfortable. So um, they um, are able to adjust the diopter to account for that. And diopters work in a number of different ways. This one pops up and then you can rotate it to set the diopter and then you pop it back down to lock it in place. And once you lock it in place, the focus between the, the two eyepieces is set um, relative to each other. There are other, type, there are other types of adjustments. Um, sometimes you find the diopter on one of the eyepieces, usually the right one, and that's this ring right here that you can rotate um, to adjust the diopter. Or the third style, and this covers pretty much all the styles of the after adjustment, is a um, is that the the center focus wheel pops out, and you find numbers. It's a little hard to see on the screen, but you find numbers there, and you can adjust the numbers there, and then you pop it back in place, and that sets the diopter adjustment. So that's how you would set um, diopter adjustments for. Those are the three most common methods. Some manufacturers have some other weird ways of doing it, but um, wherever you buy the binoculars, they should be able to explain that to you. So the most common um, binoculars that we recommend, we obviously talk to a lot of birders and people always ask us, what kind of binoculars do we recommend? And a lot of people seem to think that, you know, higher magnification is always better. And that, you know, it is true that you get a closer image of the bird, but I find that probably 60% of the people that I talk to and the binoculars I generally recommend people start with are an eight power. And I usually recommend an eight by 42 binocular or an eight by 40, something in that range. Um, 42 millimeters is a big enough objective diameter that you get really good light gathering, um, you know, in low light situations like under a can tree canopy or in you know, early morning or late evening. Um, and it's not so big that it's too hard to carry around. And the eight power is nice because you get a nice wide field and you get a nice steady image. I have pretty steady hands, but I still find that the image I get with an eight power binocular is much more pleasing and easier for me to um, interpret um, than a 10 power is. Um, I also like the wide field because most of the birds that I look at are were songbirds in woods and they tend to move around a lot and with a wide field it's easier for me to track the bird than it would be with a 10 power. Now if I was on the coast like many of you guys probably are um, and you were primarily looking at shore birds maybe you would want a higher magnification because the birds aren't moving as much you're further away from them 
and you tend not to be walking as much either. So, um, you know, there's trade-offs and, you know, it's good to have a range of optics for your particular situation so that you can choose the optic that's best suited for your particular, for whatever um, type of birding you're doing that day. Now, many of you probably also have considered in the past spotting scopes. A spotting scope operates just like a binocular, except it's bigger and heavier and generally has a range of zoom. So it's higher power where a binocular might have an eight power magnification. A spotting scope is gonna have somewhere in the neighborhood of usually probably around 15 to 20 at the low end and 50 to 60 at the high end. Um, because of that increased magnification, you have to hold a spotting scope really still. And about the only way to do that is to put it on a tripod. Um, so um, if you have a spotting scope, it's almost assuredly on some sort of tripod. Um, and that makes it a little more limiting in how you can use it. For shorebirds, they're great. A um, little harder to use with songbirds. Um, the tripod is obviously heavier to carry around. The spotting scope is heavier, but you know they have a place. And I'd say probably 20% of the time I use my spotting scope, 80% um, of the time I use my binoculars. So it's great if you can have both, but if you're thinking of buying one or the other, I would definitely start with the binoculars. Now I'll come back to spotting scopes here in a little bit when I talk about digiscoping. So let's see here. I'm going to just uh, share my screen one more time and talk a little bit about care and maintenance of the binoculars. So I mentioned that we um, repair binoculars as well. Um, in addition to repairing them, one of, the service, one of the services we offer is cleaning the binoculars. And this is just a picture I took of some of the tools we use to clean them. And it's really not anything too complicated. We have some um, lens cleaner, non-ammonia based, um, most modern optics are probably okay with ammonia, but you don't want to use Windex because uh, ammonia is a pretty harsh solvent and it could damage the coatings on the optics or cause them to cloud. So um, there are plenty of, you know, any sort of eyeglass cleaner uh, works well with um, modern binoculars. Um, you want to use a lint-free cloth um, so that you don't have to worry about lint on the optics. And then you also want to have some sort of blower uh, to um, blow off the lenses before you wipe them. Uh, one of the things you don't want to do is wipe a binocular that has grit on it because you can end up scratching the lenses, either the eyepieces or the objective lenses. So we always you know, have a blower in our kit so we can blow off the binoculars, um, get them free of dust or sand and um, before we clean them. Uh, one great thing about binoculars is almost all of them are waterproof. And I say almost, it's good to check before you dump yours in the, in the sink. But um, if they get really messy, you can put them under the sink, um, use the, the sprayer to spray them off and get them nice and clean before you kind of do the finer cleaning um, to, uh, to remove fingerprints and water spots and things like that. So, um, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a good way, particularly if they've gotten really dirty, to clean off your binoculars with, um, with, with the sink. So let me just stop that. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about digiscoping, which is something that a lot of people are interested in. And that's the ability to photograph um, the scene with a camera uh, through either a spotting scope or a pair of binoculars. And it used to be um, spotting scopes had really complicated attachments to hook up DSLR cameras or point and shoot cameras so that you could take a picture of a scene. And they still have that option. But what most people have gone to today is to using their cell phone. Almost everybody carries their cell phone, and it is really easy to get a, an adapter that allows you to put it up to either your binoculars or your spotting scope so that you can um, take a picture of the image. And, you know, a lot of people take the picture just to record or to do an ID. Maybe you um, see a bird, you don't have time to look through your field guide, or you're not 100% sure based on the field guide what you're looking at. So if you can snap a quick picture, you can post it to your local forum or, um, you know, post it to eBird and people can give you suggestions or iNaturalist and help you, um, you know, narrow down what that bird is. And, you know, but you can also use it to take pictures that are um, with a cell phone that are quite good. I mean, DSLR quality. So I'm just going to show you, first of all, um, how I do it. And then I'll show you some examples of what I've done in the past um, with my phone. Um, this is uh, an adapter made by a company called PhoneScope. There are others available and it comes in two pieces. It comes with a base that is specific to your phone. And I have an iPhone 12 mini 
So it slides right in here like this, and it just holds the phone. You do have to phone take the phone out of the case. There are some that you can keep your phone in the case, but um, in this one, you have to take it out of the case. And then it has a second piece that is sized for the optic that you're gonna put it on. So this one happens to be sized for a spotting scope, but you can get these size for binocular objectives and they make a whole host of these. There's you know literally tens of dozens of these for the different types of binoculars and spotting scopes that are on the market. And together, this whole package costs about $80. And this screws onto the base like that. And once you have it, um, you have a setup like this, there's the camera and it slides right over the spotting scope like this. And the nice thing about it is um, once you get it set up, it gives you an image of what you're looking at through the spotting scope. No, I'm not focused on anything, so there's a whole lot to look at, but it works. It's almost foolproof. I mean, you can take it off, you put it back on, there's the image, you can snap your picture with the phone, and then you've got the picture to do, you know, upload to um, Merlin bird ID, so you can do a photo ID, or you can share it on social media or in one of the bird forums to get an idea of what it is you're looking at or to, to share it with others, prove to others that you actually saw it. So let me just show some images that I have taken with the spotting scope and the cell phone. Actually, it was an iPhone 6, which is I think four or five generations ago compared to what I'm using today um, and show you kind of what is possible with a um, with a spotting scope. So these were taken along the Texas coast. Uh, Houston Audubon has a, an area down on the Bolivar Peninsula called Bolivar Flats. Some of you may have been there. Um, and I took this on the side of a road. The picture on the left is what it looks like through the spotting scope. So this is with the spotting scope zoomed all the way out. That's a scissor tail flycatcher. And it was on that barbed wire fence. But then when I zoomed in with the spotting scope, I was able to get actually what is, I think, for a cell phone, quite a nice image of a scissor tail flycatcher. And um, is one I wouldn't be ashamed to post on my Facebook page. In fact, I probably did at some point. But, um, you know, that's all with a cell phone. Um, and then... Yeah. Here is a picture of a couple crested caracara at the Anahuac Wildlife Refuge um, hanging out on a solar panel that was powering a sign. But you know, one of the neat things too about a cell phone is that you can take video. And I grabbed, you know, this video of this osprey eating what I think is a fish um, on that telephone pole. So, you know, the cell phone is really. I think revolutionized birding in some way because it allows you to capture, you know, these animals in their native environment or in our native environment um, where, you know, before it was a lot more work to get these images. So I'd really encourage all of you to maybe spend some time and spend the $75 to get a cell phone adapter so that you can um, hook it up to your binoculars. And, you know, it takes a little practice, particularly if you're using it with a pair of binoculars to get the images. But um, anybody is capable of taking these types of images. I've not spent a lot of time trying to do it. And um, it really, I think, adds to the enjoyment and allows you to share it with others. Oh, I mean to start that again. So with that, um, I think I have opened it up for questions. I wanted to leave plenty of time for people's questions. Let me just find the chat again. And um, there it is. So... Um, Anybody have any questions? I'm going to do my speaker. Actually, I have a question. Sure. About when I was at the big week, they had um, like a, a brand new binocular that was a lighter weight. Could you explain? Uh, do you know which one I'm talking about? Was so you're probably one? talking about the Zeiss SFL. Oh, maybe it's Zeiss. So um, this is the Zeiss Victory SF. So this is kind of the Zeiss's flagship binocular. Um, they came out last, at the biggest week was actually they were taking pre-orders and we were the ones selling them. They came out with the Victory SFL, which um, I think stands for super fast, lightweight. Um, the key advantage is it's cheaper. So this binocular retails for about $2,900. The SFL retails for about $1,800. So it's about $1,000 less. Um, the optics are superb. 
Um, and it's got a, it's a slightly smaller form factor. This is a 42 millimeter, the SFL is a 40 millimeter. So it's a little more compact. And I think they use some lightweight materials in its construction. So it's even lighter still than it would be just by its size. And it also has a very fast focus mechanism. So it doesn't take a lot of turns to go from a near focus to a, a far focus. And that's, you know, when you're comparing different types of binoculars, that's something you want to look at. And I'm not picking on any particular brand, but for instance, Suarez, Swarovski, I have a pair of Swarovskis. I find that to go from a bird that's six feet away to a bird that's, you know, 60 feet away takes a few turns on the focus wheel. With the Zeiss and the Leica that I own, it takes fewer turns. Some people might like the, the, the slower focus because it allows them to maybe be more precise in the focus. I personally like to be able to go from near to far quickly. So, you know, I prefer the fast focus, but that's really a matter of personal preference. And, you know, one of the things the Zeiss binoculars offer is the faster focus. So those are the primary differences um, with those new binoculars. Okay, and Kelsey would like to know, I would like to know what would be a good spotting scope for a large field? For a large field of view. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, there isn't a single answer for that. If you want a spotting scope that has a large field, you, you need to look at the specs, but generally speaking, the bigger the diameter of the objective, the wider the field of view is going to be. And the lower the magnification, the wider field of view is going to be. So if you want a really wide field, you probably want to look for a spotting scope that has a low power in the 15, 20, or 25 power, as opposed to the 30 or 35 power, because at that lower end, you're going to have a wider field. Um, you probably also want to, you know, go gravitate towards a bigger objective, um, you know, the 65 or 77 millimeter, as opposed to like a 50 or 55 millimeter. Um, but, you know, that'd be... All, you'll have to check the specs of the spotting scope you're looking at to see if it has a field that's as wide as what you want. I mean, keep in mind that a binocular is always gonna have a much, much wider field than any spotting scope. And, you know, spotting scopes like binoculars, um, there's a wide price range. Spotting scopes tend to be more expensive. You know, about the least expensive spotting scope is that is that you're probably going to be happy with is going to be in the three to five hundred dollar range, and you can spend you know over six thousand depending on the brand and the size. Anybody else? I see someone raise his hand. Let me see your name. So Jared, did you have a question? You'll need to unmute. <laughs> I wanted to ask you what you do, thought of the Trophy XLT Bone Collector. The what? The Bone Collector? That's, that's what's on there. Uh, so the brand is Trophy? It's a Trophy XLT. So unfortunately, I'm not familiar with that brand. Um, I'd have to do some research to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I have a question. Okay. So like you service binoculars, you only service the ones that you sell or if someone has a pair from a brand, like for example, Eagle, that's no longer in business. Do you service those? We absolutely service all brands. Okay. And one of the things that particularly older binoculars, we have a huge bone yard of um, binocular bodies and parts. Um, there's only really you know, half a dozen factories in the world that make binoculars. <laughs> and even though there's, you know, dozens and dozens of brands, they all come out of the same places. And um, so usually we can find a replacement part, even if the company that, you know, you bought your binoculars from, like Bushnell. Bushnell's not really in business anymore, even though I think the brand still lives on. If you have an old pair of Bushnells, chances are good that we either have a, a body for that particular model, or we have an equivalent part that will fit right on there. Um, and we, you know, we, we almost always are able to find a replacement part for an older pair of binoculars. And, you know, one thing, like a lot of people, what's very popular with people is these older Zeiss Jenna binoculars. Um, they were popular in the fifties. They were made in, I think, 
uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, either East or West Germany after World War II. And they're not really Zeiss. Like Zeiss was two companies that got split when Germany was split. And uh, the Zeiss that's in existence today isn't the Zeiss that made those binoculars. So people always call them and say, hey, can you fix these? And they're like, well, no, we can't, but call Lancy and Sky. So we fix a lot of Zeiss Jenna binoculars and uh, um, we're usually able to get them in pretty good condition even when they're in pretty rough shape. So I, so I have a question. So a binocular for a beginner, I had somebody ask me this, what would you recommend? Is there a couple different brands or what, so, what do you recommend? So I would, um, I, so first of all, I'd almost always recommend an eight by 42 unless size is a key consideration in which case I'd say eight by 32. Um, for a beginner, I mean, it depends on the budget. But um, I'll tell you a brand I really like is um, Vortex at the very bottom of the price point is in the, you know, one, 180 to 240. Um, the thing I like about Vortex is that they have a lifetime no fault warranty. So, you know, for a couple hundred dollars, you get a nice optic that has a really outstanding warranty. Um, as you go up from there, Koa makes some really nice binoculars in kind of the three to four hundred dollar range. And um, you know, as you go up in price, you do go up in I don't want to say quality, but you go up in image quality. The op, the glass is better, the coatings are better, so you're going to get a you know you're going to get a better, higher quality image of whatever it is you're looking at as you go up in price. So I'd say kind of for a beginner, I'd either steer people towards the Vortex or if they've got a little more budget, the Koa. Jerry, do you have another question? You'll just have to unmute one more time. Oops, he's still muted. Yeah, I think he's working on it. There you go. I found another name on these binoculars that I never realized. It's called the Bushnell Trophy. Are you okay. familiar with that? So Bushnell is the brand. I am familiar with Bushnell. So Bushnell was a premium brand I don't know exactly when, before my time in the business, but I want to say in the 80s, maybe into the 90s. Um, but they stopped. I don't know if they went out of business or what happened, but they um, sold the name off. So I think they still exist, but they're not the same company. And uh, but if those are an older pair of Bushnells, they're probably, you know, they're probably pretty good because the Bushnells, the, the, the Bushnells from the 80s were made in Japan. And, um, you know, people still use them today. Um, it's a 10 by 42. Yep. And it at the bottom, it says 325 feet. Yeah. So 325 is the field of view. So that's, that is how many feet um, side to side you see at a thousand yards. So if you're looking at something a thousand yards away, you would see 300, the, the, the distance from one edge of the view to the other would be about 325 feet. So, um, you know, those are pretty typical for a 10 by 42, that field of view. Um, you know, it's, it, it is true if you have a pair of binoculars from the 70s, even if they were the top of the line binoculars from the 70s, if you put your eyes, if you compare them to a top of the line binocular today, you will probably see a big difference because the glass, well, glass deteriorate, it doesn't deteriorate, but, you know, coatings can deteriorate over time and the coating technology um, that exists today wasn't even dreamed of 40 years ago. So uh, it's always not to say that those old binoculars are not good, but you may want to consider a new pair just to uh, um, see what you're missing. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if I can afford 1800 though. Well, there's lots of stuff in between. So, you know, come into a store like ours that sells binoculars, bring your uh, existing ones and see if you see a difference. Maybe you won't. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Laura Taylor was wondering, how do you fix a ship compass? Well, so <laughs> these compasses are pretty big. Um, we we can fix the small ones, but usually it costs about six hundred dollars to fix a compass. So if it's a really small compass, it's cheaper to buy a new one. But the the ones we generally fix are about one hundred and eighty millimeters in diameter. They would be on ocean going ships, really large ships, and. Um, what generally happens is they get a leak. They have oil in them and they get a leak or they get a bubble in the oil. And so what we do is we take it all apart. We drain the oil. We replace what's called the card, which is the um, disc that has the markings on it. And um, we replace the seals and then we under vacuum refill them with oil. And that's really all there is to it. They're pretty simple devices. 
um, but they, you know, they do they do require maintenance. And they're a pretty key piece of equipment on a ship. Every ship that yeah. is commercial has to have two of them because if one breaks, they need to have a backup. Paula wants to know, is there any tricks for humidity? You so know, in Florida. Yeah. And question. you know, most almost all modern binoculars claim to be fog proof. But for those of us who live in places like Houston or Florida, there are limits to how fog proof a binocular is. Um, they're all filled, all binoculars are filled with an inert gas so that there's no moisture inside the binocular. So you don't get fogging on the inside, but I'm sure you guys have all experienced where you go from your house where it's 60 degrees or 65 degrees out into the air where it's 95 and 90% 90 humidity and you get fogging on the objective lens. And there's really not a lot you can do to prevent that except let it acclimate. So take it outside before you wanna use it. Let the, you know, what's gonna fix that is the lens warming up. It's the lens being much colder than the surrounding air that causes that fog to form. And once you, um, once that lens warms up, that fog will go away. If you are impatient, um, you can get a hair dryer and blow on it or something else with the warm air and blow on it and that fog will clear up. But it's it's hard to fight that when you're talking about the extremes of, you know, air conditioned house and uh, our air conditioned car and 100% um, humidity. Elsie wants to know, she read there are binoculars with camera technology, electronic. Do you have any information about that? So there are some that have built-in cameras. I would advise against it. And the reason I would advise against it, I would go with the cell phone on a standard pair of binoculars because, I mean, you've seen in your in our lifetimes, the 10 years that we, or the 20 years we've been using phones, how much advances there have been in the quality of the cameras and um, your ability to share them. Um, if you buy a pair of binoculars, that camera technology is likely gonna be outdated in a matter of months. So you're gonna spend a premium to have a built-in camera. It's not gonna be as shareable as um, a camera on your cell phone because it's not hooked up to the internet all the time. And you're probably gonna be getting subpar pictures within two years. Whereas a decent pair of binoculars, I mean, can last you a lifetime. So I would always say, you know, keep the binocular simple. And if you wanna take pictures, find a way to hook your cell phone up to it because you'll change your cell phone a lot more than you'll change your binoculars. Very good. Pam wants to know what size do you recommend for a small binocular that fits in a purse so she can always have it with her? So if it'll fit an eight by 32, um, because, or, or an eight by 30, that's a fairly compact binocular. Um, I don't have a pair with me that's that small, but um, I would, you know, kind of, but, or you can also go to like a seven by 25. I think um, Swarovski has a seven by 20, which is really compact and it folds up really nicely. Um, if you're going to go down and you're going to give up light gathering. So, you know, if you want a compact pair, you're getting it because you want a compact pair. It shouldn't be your primary pair of binoculars um, because I think you'll want more light gathering and when you're out in the field. But, um, but you, but you know, a seven by 20 would probably be, you know, something that I would recommend. And that would be a fairly small binocular, probably the size of, you know, I don't know, three or four inches long and two or three inches wide. So I have another question. Are there any companies that have like a move up program? So let's say you're a beginner and you buy a pair and you want to move up. Does anybody do like give you credit or anything for trade-ins? So we do as a store. Most of the manufacturers don't, but if you um, have a pair of binoculars and you want to trade them in, we'll generally give you credit towards the purchase of a new pair or whatever else you want to buy. Um, so you can just contact us. Um, our, e our, our website address is lancyskyco.com. Our email is sales at lancyskyco.com. And um, you send us, we'll probably ask you to send a couple of pictures of the binoculars, the make and model, and we can give you kind of a tentative price that we'd pay for them over the email or phone. And then, you know, if you're not local, you would send them to us and we'd kind of confirm that they are what you said they were and that they're in good shape. And once we confirm all that, we'll give you the credit and you can use them to purchase something else. Now, Paula also wants to know, is it bad to leave your binoculars in the car? 
depends on the time of year. Um, if it's cool, it's not a big deal other than they might get stolen. But um, in the summer, so those prisms that I showed you in that picture, those are generally held in place with a cement or glue. And if it's a place like Florida or Texas where it gets really hot in the car during the summer, um, doing it once won't hurt it, but continuously leaving them in the car can cause that glue to soften and crack. And if that happens, then those prisms get out of adjustment. And then you have to do what's called an alignment. And that can be, um, depending on the brand, fairly expensive. So um, best not to subject them to those kinds of temperatures, because I think once it gets over to be, you know, once it's over 100 degrees in the car, um, the materials could be damaged with, from long-term exposure. Question, Paul. Yeah, that is a good question. It's one we uh, get a lot because, you know, and look, if you have an old pair of binoculars and it's, you want to have a pair in your car, put those in your car because then you'll have them and you won't be heartbroken if uh, something happens to them. But don't put your uh, brand new um, $3,000 binoculars in your car. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Oh. Let me, is it possible for you to type in the chat your web address? I absolutely will. I'm also okay, thank share you. my uh, oh, screen again. Right. So Here let me uh, find the chat though. Hold on just a second. Or I can do it. You have this up. Yeah, yeah. There. Just type that in the chat. I lost my chat when I uh, put up my presentation, but, um, but that's our web address. Um, you can get all our contact information on the website and uh, we ship. Um, all over, well, all over the world, but definitely to Florida. And if you're going to be going to the Florida Birding and Nature Festival, we will have a booth there, um, our table. Erin um, Collins, our sales manager, she's the one who's going to be attending for us. And um, she'll be able to show you the binoculars she brings with her and answer your questions. And you can try them out if, uh, if you have time to get down to Tampa. Excellent. Yeah. Did you get the address okay? Yes, okay. thank you. Well, thank awesome. you so much for allowing me to come over and visit with you guys tonight. It was a lot of fun. We really appreciate your time and your expertise and helping us to, to be able to use our optics a lot better and looking forward to stepping up. Yeah, that yeah. was great. We're happy that I hope to meet you guys in person one day. Yes, very good. All right. All well, right. You guys have a good night.